in Brussels. But we will also have it's a hybrid event, so you can also attend if you're across abroad or you cannot travel, you can also attend digitally. And then we also have ILC Europe specific events. Very brief introduction for ILC Europe. We're now five minutes further, so I think it's really time to start with the key things of this webinar, which is a discussion. So I hand the floor over to Philip and uh, Louise. Enjoy the discussion and please participate as much as you want. So welcome everyone. I'm really delighted to be able to introduce the panel members today. Um, <clears throat> so we have a range of panel members from across industry and um, academia and civil society. So Alan Bubis is a colleague and toxicologist. Um, Hans Verhagen is a consultant um, in food safety and nutrition. Kate Halliwell is a nutritionist with the, who is the CEO of the Food and Drink Federation in the UK. Tessa Avamete is a bioeconomist from the Catholic University of Leuven. Lynn Brown joins us from the US, where she works for Harvest Plus, which aims to um, introduce biofortification of foods across the world, particularly in uh, developing countries. But Popping is an expert on food authenticity, and we were hoping to have John Ingram here today, but unfortunately he has COVID, but he will be inputting into the report that we produce. So, um, these, um, this in, we're, we're very aware that the Ukraine-Russian crisis is providing lots of issues on all kinds of um, things in, in the current climate. What we're concerned with today is the impact on the food system. So without further ado, I think I'll hand over to Philip to introduce the webinar and uh, we'll take questions as they arrive. Thanks very much, Louise, um, and welcome everybody. Um, so I'm going to get the ball rolling with really, um, I think, a question that can just start our discussion. And I'm going to put this question to Kate Halliwell from the Food and Drink Federation. So Kate, could you outline uh, briefly for us what, what the short and medium term impacts of the war in Ukraine will be for this food supply in Europe? Yeah, of course, Philip. So I'd say, as you'd expect, it's multifaceted and quite complicated, um, particularly because it is building on top of uh, what's gone before. Uh, so as in uh, COVID and then particularly in the UK EU exit. So these are all things that are building on top of a system which is already very stretched. Um, and that I think is particularly pertinent when you're thinking about prices and price rises. Um, so in terms of the immediate effects that we're seeing, um, of course, the huge uh, fuel and energy uh, rises have a large impact on uh, certainly on food manufacturing, which is who um, where I know most, um, because it is a fuel intensive um, industry. Uh, so that's putting price rises up and that will continue because some of what's coming through from Ukraine, we haven't actually seen that knock on yet. In terms of ingredients, the most immediate impact has been on vegetable oils. So specifically sunflower oil, uh, which grows about 60% of uh, the world's supply, but actually exports more than that. So it exports about 75%. Um, and certainly here in the UK is over 80% actually of our sunflower oil. So that's, and that's in a lot of foods. Um, there's also an impact to rapeseed. Again, actually we grow quite a lot of rapeseed in Europe, um, but there is, uh, and so although the Ukraine specifically doesn't grow anywhere near the same amount as for sunflower, it's still quite a large exporter. So if you look at globally, that will have quite an impact. And of course, as we um, have much less sunflower oil and people look to alternative oils, rapeseed is one of the obvious ones. So that increases the pressure there. So vegetable oils have been the immediate ingredient impact uh, with their derivatives. So certain emulsifiers for example, would also be derived from sunflower oil. And certainly we are already seeing companies who, are, who would be out by now of sunflower oil and some of those emulsifiers. The other um, big impact I would say in this sort of moving more to, well, so corn and wheat, obviously. Wheat, uh, again, thinking about um, GB, UK, uh, we actually grow a lot um, of our own wheat, but because it's a global commodity, um, that means that if prices go up because of the shortfall, 
it will still impact across all countries, regardless almost of whether you grow some. Um, so that those I would say for us are probably more into going into the medium because some of it is going to depend on the harvest. So what's going in the ground now, both in the Ukraine and across Europe. Um, so that's because if it's obviously if it's not grown and harvested in the Ukraine, that will impact through into post autumn. Um, but the other sort of major impact which is playing into all of this is fertilizers. So um, there's much less fertilizer um, coming through. So some of the raw ingredients come from Russia. Um, and so at, right now, farmers basically are making those decisions about what to plant. And if the fertilizer is too expensive, economically, it is better for them to grow less um, because, you know, to recruit, uh, they won't recruit costs because of the cost of the fertilizer. And so in the mid sort of, if you say midterm is autumn, then I would say there's a lot of um, unpredictability around what we might expect to see coming through on the crops. Um, so I think that probably covers off the, the broad sweep. Of yeah, th 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 thanks so much, Kate. Yeah, I, I think um, Ukraine produces, I mean, you mentioned some of the key commodities, but I think it's about 30% of Europe's wheat, 50% or more of Europe's corn, and something like 40% of Europe's sunflower oil. So these are big, these are big hitters. Um, so you focused, as I asked, on Europe, but maybe then we could widen this out to um, what about outside Europe? How do you see the impacts there? Um, I think... Sorry, Sorry, this was for Lynn. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think when you move outside Europe, then the impact becomes enormous, to be honest. Um, you know, we need to set this in a context whereby food prices are at the highest level in 60 years. And when you think about the 2007 and 2008 crisis, that came off the back of the 6.2% GDP growth rate. This crisis comes off of the back of a 4.5% contraction and a set of government, governments that have been running welfare programs to protect their people from COVID. So you're in a very, very different situation. You know, if I highlight a couple of countries, for example, Yemen gets 46% of its calories from wheat. And a third of those come from Russia and Ukraine. Almost 50% of people in Yemen receive some form of food aid, generally from the World Food Programme. Now, they do an annual appeal. In March 2022, their needs are higher because prices are higher. And yet the appeal will receive 30% less funding this year than it did the previous year, even though the prices are higher. So that is a major problem. If you look at Egypt, 85% of their wheat imports, and it's a bread economy, come from Russia and Ukraine. A third of them would be imported this quarter of the year. 100% of their sunflower oil comes from Russia and Ukraine. So when you start thinking about that, we sort of talked in our pre-meeting about the food price riots that came around 2007, 2008, because governments, a lot of governments subsidize these products. So government budgets are not flexible anymore to be able to subsidize these. So this is heading for a cliff in many senses, and it will have a much sort of more long-term thing because you know, I mean, food is maybe 20% of a consumer price index in Europe. It's 40% and more in many African countries and Asian countries. So if you're poor in Africa, you're spending 60 to 70% of your budget on food. So where is the wiggle room to adjust that when the prices go up even more? So yeah, it's going to have major issues you know, that ripple across all sorts of areas in the rest of the world. Great. Th thanks so much, Lynn. I think the other thing that Kate mentioned was this issue of fertilizers, which is, you know, producing um, the next round of crops. And uh, so, so, Bert, uh, I mean, maybe you could comment on the impact of this again on, on global supplies and the type of products that might be uh, commodities that might be grown. 
Certainly, uh, both Lynn and Kate already mentioned the, the importance of fertilizer. I think when we talk about grains and crops in general, we need to take a step back to fertilizers. And uh, if we look at what the uh, Agriculture and Food Policy Institute uh, in Texas predicted, they said that we're seeing companies and farmers defaulting because there's a negative cash flow due to the increase in prices of fertilizer. So right now, uh, we see about a 50% price of increase in grains, but about a 150% increase, uh, increase in fertilizer prices. So basically, you can't make that equation work anymore. And that will subsequently impact on how much grain is produced in the world. So that will trickle on to other uh, areas. And also, if farmers default, if there is a negative cash flow, and if that is not just one farmer, but a series of farmer, we will not only have a food crisis, but on top of that, a financial crisis, which basically is, is a negative spiral. So I think we have a high risk here. At the same time, we're also looking at a number of countries that I've already said that they can compensate for some of the shortfalls that we're seeing. And the two main countries that will probably make a positive impact is Canada and India. India right now produce about, what, that 13, 14% of the global wheat production. And they say they have capacity to ramp it up and, and they already export it much more. Previously, they, they used to export like about 1% of, of their um, wheat production, the rest was consumed uh, internally in India. So now they are ramping up their exports. So that is a good sign, but of course it all comes at a price. I think we are, we're having multiple factors here that impact not only the, the European um, market for food, but also, and in particular, the global market. Yeah. Thanks so much. I think you 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 bring our, uh, us on to sort of the next issue, which is, um, I mean, seeking different sources for commodities, but maybe substitutions. I don't know whether any of the panelists has a view on whether we should be thinking about um, substitutions and the impact of, of finding substitutions. I'm thinking, for example, for sunflower oil. Um, you know, can we, can we um, seek similar oils from other, other producers, for example, and what the implications of that might be um, for example, around um, regulatory aspects of, of, of these, these commodities. So I don't know who would um, like to comment on, on uh, whether we need to now start seeking um, alternative uh, sources, but also alternative types of commodity to fill these gaps. But well, I maybe think... I... Sorry, you go ahead, Lynn. I was going to say, I mean, I think the market will naturally shift to substitutes. Um, if you look at 2007, mm -hmm. 2008, the crisis ended up being wheat, maize and rice, even though it started in the wheat market because people substituted to maize and then some even went to rice. Now, if you look at something like a rice market, it's very, very thinly traded and governments panicked. So governments actually will put export bans on. So you can say you're going to switch somewhere else, but if the government puts an export ban on, you don't have a choice. Mm. And I mean, I can look at Vietnam, you know, they had a bumper rice harvest. I think it was 2007 or 2008 and the government was fine, but then everybody else put bans on and then the government suddenly decided, okay, maybe we should also block our exports. They blocked it long enough that the rice price fell and their farmers didn't get the profits that they could have got if they'd have been able to sell. Mm -hmm. So I think it's one thing to change commodities. It's another thing whether you can actually get the commodities when people end up in trade policies that basically beg mm -hmm. a Yeah. I mean, one of the things, um, you know, I'm most familiar with the world of fats and oils um, is the infant formula industry, for example, is a big user of sunflower oil. And I wonder maybe Hans or Alan might be able to um, give a consideration of, you know, seeking alternative sources. I, I understand the um, Ukrainian source sunflower oil is produced to an extremely uh, high, high level, uh, high quality level, whether seeking other sources might bring with it um, risks around uh, lower quality uh, materials. Of course, sunflower oil is just one example. Hans, would you like to start on that at all? 
you get a very uh, thanks philip you get a very uh, general uh, answer uh, of course our food supply has been uh, selected over the years over the decades to be nutritionally adequate as well as uh, safe now that uh, we may perhaps be confronted with a change in uh, sourcing materials we i think there will be a challenge but I, I would call it a challenge not a problem to identify which other sources could provide for similar nutrients and of course there's not only sunflower in, in the world there's also other oils and they may have a different uh, composition of fatty acids, etc. But the nutritionist will not have so many difficulties trying to, let's say, uh, find another oil or a blend of oils in order to achieve the same nutritional perspective. In addition to that, from the safety perspective, I would say uh, the, the system in uh, in Europe, in uh, many places in the world, has been uh developed so well that our food is essentially safe for chemical contaminants etc and i think uh, we will also be able to source materials that are equally safe in case that will cause a problem we will have another challenge which we should not run away from but solve and um, to that expect i think that we should also uh, uh, may it ever happen that we have uh, source materials that cannot be 100% uh, safe, 100% safety doesn't even exist, that we uh, look at it from the perspective of public health. Because in the end, we need to eat and not eating is not an option. So we need to, no, we need to treat this in a, a very uh, prudent way and mm -hmm. open the discussion. And that's exactly on the interplay between risk assessors and risk managers. So to date, it has been very simple. Food shall be safe, 100%, everything under the maximum residue levels and, and limit values, et cetera, if not off the market. Okay, we should keep that. If that is not possible for one way or another, and we are now confronted with the fact that some things are not possible, uh, also outside also the nutrition area, we should discuss it and see what we can achieve. And to the best of our knowledge, and I think that toxicologists, nutritionists, scientists, etc., can really inform the public, the debate and the policy decisions. Yeah, thanks. That that's really good. So, so Alan, I mean, maybe you would like to comment. Um, uh, so, so Hans, you know, said that he would give a general sort of response. Um, I mean, whether there are specific comments, perhaps around pesticides and other contaminants um that we should be wary of in this current debate about the sort of commodities we're considering well i, th I agree with hans i think um over the years we it's it's an unusual situation probably <laughs> but um over the years not just european wide but globally we've put in a place a system to try and ensure that food is safe from residues and contaminants and so that I think substitution uh, would not necessarily automatically lead to an issue with um, excessive exposure to those. But we've identified a couple of issues that do need to be looked at. One is allergenicity. And in the short term, uh, many recipes need substitution of sunflower oil with another oil. And it won't be possible in the short term to label the food. So the question then is, does that give rise to an increased risk of allergenicity in sensitive individuals? The answer is that from what we've looked at so far, no, but we need to look at that quickly and come to a decision. The second is if we switch from a predominantly sunflower oil based diet to something else, does it increase exposure to something naturally in the oil that may increase the risk? Again, we need to look at that. Um, and the third is, of course, the nutritional aspects, um, which uh, Hans has, has mentioned already. And, and, the, and, the, and I think there's a really important point I wish want to expand on slightly, which is about food safety versus food security. Food is a public health issue. The Western consumer at the moment has really no appetite for taking that into account. And I think going forward in the medium to long term, we're going to have to have a serious discussion about that. Because when it becomes a question of, are we going to be able to feed our children or not? It's a different issue as to whether the trace of this pesticide is an issue or not. 
Yeah, thanks very much, Alan. Um, I'm going to go to Bert because he's got his hand up, and then I'll go to Tessa on uh, because you've introduced the consumer, Alan. I think Tessa might have something uh, valuable to contribute there. But Bert, you've been waiting patiently. Thank you, and I just want to add we have two types of uh, aspect that we need to look at here. It's the replacement in terms of maybe replacing sunflower oil with uh, canola oil, but we also when we talk about safety have a heightened risk of food adulteration, especially in situations where prices rise. And I want to put that into perspective. There was a study released uh, by, I think it was funded by FSA, um, that said that during COVID, during Corona times, the average um, food fraud incidence rate rose by 30%, and that is basically balanced across the, the media as well as the government reporting sites. There is another slide uh, in, in the publication that says that they found 90% increase of food fraud. Mm. I think that needs to be taken with a pinch of salt. So the 90% came from a, a private company monitoring scheme. And, and here we need to dig a little bit deeper into the data to see what was actually incidences, so actual cases versus what they call inferences. So that is basically when you see a publication on something and you say, okay, there must be some food fraud on, on, on rice or something. So um, I think those data have to be taken with a pinch of salt, but the 30% of Corona during Corona time, the increase that we saw is very likely to increase now with a heightened situation where we have additional shortages of fertilizer. The other one was just a disruption of the supply chain, but now we have gaps in the supply chain because we have price rises, we have uh, the, the lack of wheat from Ukraine, we have the lack of sunflower oil, and not all of that can be easily compensated. So I think food industry is well advised to revisit their vulnerability assessment, again, in, the, in light of the, of the current crisis. Thanks very much. Yeah, I'll come to you now, Tessa, for, for your input, maybe from the consumer perspective. Yeah, yeah, indeed. So far, we've heard uh, a lot about all the actors in the in the food supply chain, and indeed, prices um, from the from the start of the chain up to farmers, retailers, food industry have gone up. If we look at Europe, we don't see that price rise yet reflected in the prices in the supermarkets. What we see um, when we look at consumers and citizens, they they are worried. That has been during COVID, and we see it now again with the Ukraine crisis. People are worried that the food supplies will, yeah, that there will be disruption, that they won't get enough food. Um, they, they're looking even close by, closing uh, to local food supplies to assure that they do have enough food. What we see overall is that there's a lot of misunderstanding and miscommunication towards the consumer in the media. Um, they, uh, they, for example, if you look at food prices, people say, oh, well, prices are so, food is so expensive. But if we look at that from a historical perspective, food has never been as cheap as it is today. We, and now I'm talking, for example, in Flanders, we only spend 14% of our income to food. That's different across Europe, of course. In, in, in Romania, it is 23%, while in the UK, it's the lowest in Europe, which is below 8% even. But if we then look at the south, southern countries, uh, um, then we see up to 60% of the income, as, as Lina already mentioned, then if you have a food price that, that goes up, that's, that's a disaster for the people, of course. But people don't realize, and what I especially want to mention here is that I see it as a really missed opportunity from policymakers, from media, from all the stakeholders, it's in fact, that we don't put the emphasis when it comes to consumers on health. Um, COVID has been such a dramatic, has had such a dramatic impact in Europe because of people being unhealthy. In Europe, in many European countries, over half of the people have suffer from overweight, which leads to, yeah, of course, uh, we being very vulnerable to COVID. And now again, with the Ukraine crisis, it would be good if we put much more pressure on much more importance towards people eating healthy. And together with that, of course, also a reduction in meat consumption. Because if we look at Ukraine, they're indeed providing a lot of food, but they're providing a lot of fodder not of direct food consumption. And there are also things that, of course, shape our food system. And we need to think about that carefully. Is this the food system that we want? Or do you want to transform it? And if you want to transform it, what are then the key leverages? 
it's not going to work with brochures or just information. It's going to be much tougher than that to change consumption behavior and to change food system. Okay, I'm going to hand over to Louise to chair for a little while now and give me a rest. <laughs> and I think I think that brings up a really important point to sort about whether we can make changes in our food system. But um, uh, you have your hand up. I think you wanted to comment on that. Yes, I think it's a, it's a very good comment of Tessa. And I, I just wanted to um, learn from Tessa if she thinks that now is a good time to change to a more plant based food system. And if yes, uh, what we see when we look at the meat alternative markets right now is that they're using a lot of ingredients which are kind of questionable, at least. Uh, so uh, we look at very highly processed ingredients. So are we replacing something that is not good for us with something that may be even less good for us? Can we, can we make wiser choices? A very good point that you raised there. First of all, indeed, when it comes to nutrition health, we need to assure that we inform consumers to, to make that transition, to, to make that protein shift in a healthy way. Replacing meat by something that is not valuable, that is not rich in proteins, for example, it doesn't, or even when you look at a lot of people being vegetarian or even vegan, um, consuming uh, too few proteins at the end of the day, that is, of course, not, not healthy at all. And we need... We need a lot more of communication towards consumers, uh, especially I would say young consumers, because that's that's where the emphasis should be in my in my point of view. And then when you look at the shift that also needs to take place at the production side, um, I think there's a lot of responsibility in the hands of uh, policymakers, because especially in Europe, what farmers decide is a lot policy driven. They, they make up their business models, and that business model is, for some sectors, still based on subsidies. And, I mean, they're entrepreneurs just like any other entrepreneur, right? So if that system works, it's fine. But policymakers should realize that if they support investment in certain sectors, these investments are for 20, 30 years, for next generations farmers, not just for one legislation. It might be popular for the next legislation, but not popular in the long run for our farmers. So we need to be... I think we just lost Tessa then. Um, Kate, I'm going to come to you because I think when we talk about the substitution and the changes that we might have to make in the short term, there are some other really practical things. Um, that we might also need to address. So I think people have touched on labeling and if we make substitutions. So it may be that we have to think about changing regulations because at the moment it's very, um, very precise and carefully monitored what you're allowed to say on a package. But I guess a lot of the big companies that are making products that have to change their um, ingredients now in the face of the shortages will also have to change their packaging and their labeling. Yeah, sure. Um, so as you say, this is, is sort of taking us, I guess, right back down from, from thinking about continued, I guess, political pressure on the food systems and back to kind of the immediate um, of what's actually kind of happening right now. Um, so thinking about substitution. So, so far, this has just been on oils. Um, so bringing it back to that. Um, so effectively, um, because uh, so what, what would be set out on your label uh, is defined by the Food Information to Consumers um, regulation uh, in Europe and uh, it is retained law in the UK, so we have the same. And that um, obviously sets out things like your ingredients deck, your nutrition declaration, all of those things are very precisely uh, set out. And um, there is an issue in terms of the short term substitution of sunflower oil, both in terms of packaging uh, from an environmental perspective. So you don't particularly want to destroy a load of packaging that's already been printed, um, but also practically that it takes a little bit of time to print packaging and it will take longer to print the packaging than certainly with the sunflower oil um, initial changes, it would have been there would have been a gap in production. So effectively the choice was gaps in productions of certain products or how do we look at having the substitution but with um, labeling that's not compliant with the FIC. Um, 
And what countries across Europe, member states have done so, TG Sanko wrote a letter out uh, to member states. They're not changing the regulation, it's an enforcement issue. And that means it becomes a member state issue. And so different countries have taken slightly different approaches through this. Um, so in, um, in the UK, actually, one of the big differences that we have done compared to uh, most of the member states that I've seen, certainly, is that the FSA has undertaken specific risk assessments um, of the oils. So, so far we've had rapeseed oil go through that risk assessment. And that is going back to things like the allergenicity. Is there a, a, an immediate food safety issue in that swap? Um, we are anticipating further oils in the next week or two. The rest, or certainly most of the European member states I've seen, um, have actually kind of given a bit of a blanket to non-allergenic uh, refined vegetable oils. So there's a bit of a difference there. Then in terms of consumer information, people have taken quite different approaches, actually. So some member states have said that companies have to over sticker onto the label. Uh, some have asked that some sort of code goes into where you would normally print your um, best before news by date because you print those afterwards, you know, so the packaging's already done, there's a, um, a specific bit and you print in factory. So they've asked for either a code or a certain amount of wording. Um, some have in, and, and this is the case in the UK, some have said if that's not possible, they're ideals, then there needs to be consumer information in the store um and, and obviously on, on websites and things but you know whilst that's the easiest thing to do the reality is that's not a um particularly useful thing for a consumer making a choice in the store um all of those clearly need to be time bound um people want to get back to having labels that are accurate um but because the chains are still in flux that again is a little bit tricky actually um, and so the choices here really are, so you could print packaging now, so I, if I already know I'm using rapeseed oil, I could reprint my packs, put rapeseed oil on. Of course, in a few months time, we might have an issue with rapeseed oil, or some plant oil might come back. And, you know, so it might, you might kind of go through this several periods of it not being right and you're playing catch up. The alternative, which again, some member states have allowed and some haven't because it's an enforcement derogation, is that you use um, effectively something along the lines of vegetable oils, brackets, sunflower rapeseed, where, um, where you are allowed to have zero. So currently within the regs, if you declare a varying proportion, it all has to still be present. Whereas this way, effectively, you're saying it can be there, it, it cannot be there. Um, so that would enable companies to have a bit more surety when they go to print of, of, so there's not this ongoing issue with packaging being printed that can't be used um also just again practically it means that printers can stage the printing because again if everyone has to change their labels at the same time across europe there's only so many printers that will do that um, so that can create issues particularly for small and medium-sized companies actually who don't maybe have quite the same pull at the printing with the printer um, and for a consumer, it means there may be something listed that isn't present, uh, which, you know, is not ideal. It's not where we'd want to be, but at least you would have an awareness. So if you were trying to avoid a particular oil, you would know it is possible it's there. Um, and if you are particularly concerned, you can, of course, contact the company who would be able to tell you from their traceability information exactly what's there. Um, but those are their, their ongoing discussions. Member states are coming through with decisions at differing times and some have still to make that decision. Thank you. So that's a whole issue that not a lot of people have probably thought about, but that has huge impact on waste, etc. And Tessa, you want to come back on the packaging issue? I don't know. Uh, Kate really pointed uh, nicely on, on the substitution in, in the food industry sector. But I think another point that might be interesting to see now in the in the coming years is how, for example, cultured meat will enter the, the market. And uh, because there, in terms of legislation, there's still quite a lot of work to be done in Europe. As I understand, in Canada, they're way, way ahead of us. Cultured meat being not land-based. So in a way, um, yeah, that, that makes it more robust when it comes to shocks um, 
in the in the food system. So I, I think also these kind of, of things taking into account, for example, what I said in, in terms of fodder and the dependency of Europe on soy, on wheat from outside European Union, these are, are I think, um, yeah, tendencies that will, will be re reinforced by what we see now, both with COVID and with Ukraine crisis. And I see um, in Europe, there are a couple of companies Frontrunner in that in Israel we have uh, a number of companies I know and then in uh, yeah outside Europe as well so it will, will be nice also there in terms of legislation communication towards the consumers to see what uh, yeah how how it will uh, continue but I don't know Kate if you are aware uh, of that uh, uh, opportunities. Um, I mean, certainly there is a lot of discussion generally about, in a forward look of labelling um, around uh, both in Europe as part of their kind of um, uh, farm to fork, and then here in the UK we'll have it as part of our food strategy um, around looking at uh, sort of, I guess, eco labelings, what that might mean, what parameters you would put into that, and that's a massive debate in itself, which might include meat and animal welfare and uh i'm not aware of cultured meat uh particularly within that but you could see that it could be part of that or certainly part of the um carbon calculation um so you know the, the, i think there's a lot coming through in the future on that in terms of what will go on to pack um and, and similar nutrition uh, again both uh, europe and the uk are looking at their front pack approaches for that um which i think anything that obviously giving the consumer information is great in terms of when you're in this kind of situation then there is that consideration of well what does that mean because a bit i didn't touch on with the labeling previously the wins was of course if you substitute that impacts the nutrition label as well um depending you know so some flat to rate actually you tend to have uh, i think you have less that so that's not so you know people probably aren't as or public health nutritionists aren't as concerned but certainly palm oil which would be one of the things we're looking at that's going to have real, you know, ring alarm bells uh, in the environment and also has a much higher saturated fat content. And so the more we add into the label and the information that's actually on pack and not digital, then in this specific kind of crisis in situation, the more we have to think about, well, what, how do we handle that and what would we do? Thanks. I can see that Bert's got his hand up. So, Bert, would you like to add yes, to this? Yes, it's, uh, it's a question to both of you, Tessa and Kate. Uh, one of the things that we're seeing or that we have seen until COVID stroke was a lot of innovative product and, and uh, Tessa mentioned the, the cultured meat products, uh, meat alternative products. So how much of an impact and, and most of, of the, the innovation or much of the innovation was driven by startup companies. So how much of an impact do you think the current crisis will have on the development of innovative food products? Yeah, what we see right now when it comes to, for example, then uh, protein rich um, uh, uh, crops, that is something that also in, in one of the recent uh, uh, declarations of Europe uh, um, was written that, that Europe wants to inv invest in protein rich crops uh, like soy, like quinoa, uh, etc. At the same time, when I then hear the farmers talking about that, there's still a way to go when it comes to productivity. There's a lot of, um, at least in our region, and then I know it's, it's the same in many of, uh, of our neighboring countries as well, uh, the yields are not really stable. And as a farmer, of course, if your yields are not stable and uh, you're not sure that the food industry is going to take, uh, going to buy in your products, then it doesn't make sense. And you better keep to those uh, crops that you're sure at least you get a minimum price. So there's still a lot, uh, a long way to go. And uh, yeah, some some people say uh, very easily like our farmers should change from yeah and, and invest in, in these crops like uh, chickpea as well. But if you don't then look nowadays at the productivity and at the stability and at the cost price of inputs, it's not yet so favorable. And also, food industry puts a high uh, yeah of course a, a high level on the, on the quality. If the quality from from outside Europe is better for these crops. Yeah, then, then they will still uh, feed their, their uh, current suppliers. That's, that's quite obvious. It's an uh, economy, right? Thank you, Tessa. I think we will still see some innovation and adaptions. Um, you know, it's a highly uh, innovative market, generally, uh, I would say. But it, 
certainly in the again in the sort of short term so by which i mean you know the next few months i would imagine some of that will slow um partly just uh, well, mainly costs um so you know costs are spiraling and innovation is expensive so you'd have to be pretty confident that you had um you know a good market to launch into for that to, to justify that and certainly through covid some of what we saw was um we did still see some innovation but actually we saw quite a few companies stripping back into core lines because that is actually uh that overarching reduces the cost of production for them um so i i think it would be very dependent on individual companies we'll see some but i can certainly with the the price pressures that everyone's facing, I can imagine that that would slow. That's interesting. Thank and you. I think we've got some, I think Alan's got his hand up. Yeah, I'll come back to Alan. Please go ahead. Thanks. I wanted to ask um, if any on the panel had um, given thought to a strategy to deal with the impending catastrophe that we might face based on um, uh, conspiracy theory uh, and populism, which is, you know, we can't deny that it's a major factor in society today. And the idea of weaponizing anything that happens is a really serious problem. And so I'm thinking there needs to be a strategy for communication and clarity to explain exactly why regulators and policymakers are doing what they're doing. We saw it partly through COVID. I think generally speaking we managed that quite well not perfectly but you know the public went along with it for a long time but you can well imagine that when we say we've had to substitute um one oil for another there will be some, one group of people saying that's just a scam to make money and we need to make we have to have a communication strategy in place in advance to make sure that we bring the consumer with us rather than against us Uh, well, I would completely agree. I, uh, I think government should have a communication strategy on this. Um, they, well, I mean, there has been some limited uh, comments from the FSA and Food Standards Scotland here. Uh, I'm not aware of uh, where the member states have sat in Europe. Um, as I said, I think generally uh, the comms on it has been, or some of the information I've seen has been focused on the companies providing the information for the substitution, um, as opposed to a, you know, an overarching strategy. Um, but yeah, I think that that to me um, makes sense, and because it can also reinforce um, both uh, if there are concerns uh, around food safety that those aspects have been looked at, and that that isn't a concern. Um, but also, I think there's something well. It would have to be carefully managed but about making sure we don't have panic buying as well um because if there's a random newspaper story that says oh sunflower oh you're not going to have any and everyone decides to go and buy it then there will be an issue for the average consumer which you know becomes a self-generated thing and we certainly saw that at the start of covid um with you know the initial empty shelves that were seen were because people and they weren't over buying a lot and you know most you know I, I certainly did it on a couple of things so I can't be judgmental about it but people only have to over shop a little bit and we really start to see a problem so again I think having that careful managed communication strategy could really help ensure a smoother flow of goods uh, and, and goods remaining on shelf. I'm very mindful of the time and I think we have some questions from the audience so if it's okay, can I ask um, if anyone would like to comment on the food import financing facility that was announced by the FAO yesterday? Is anybody aware of that? Yeah, I have to say I don't have full details on this, but I do know that they were trying to set one up. Um, and it's about you know, much of the conversation we've had has talked about European nations who have a freedom in actual fact to set policies and regulations and everything else without a consideration of a huge part of the world that are much more dependent on what happens. So European nations have, you know, government has the resources, industry has the resources to pay a certain degree of higher prices, 
to have market power in those relationships, etc. Whereas many of the countries I work with in Africa and Asia do not have any of that. Um, so this is about enabling countries to be able to import uh, from the food markets, because in actual fact, most of the countries I work with, their debt loads has gone up because of addressing COVID. They really don't have any spare resources to be doing this type of thing. And I think, you know, if you look at, for me, it's an interesting question of, um, we had a crisis in 73, 74, which most of you probably won't remember, but that is the crisis that led to the green revolution in agriculture and huge input increases in agricultural productivity. The next one was 2007, 2008. After that, 2010, 2012. After that, 2020 with COVID and now 2022 with Ukraine. So maybe we need to rethink a global food system because it is a global food system. It's just in Europe, we're lucky enough that we can grow a huge amount of our staples and we rely on Africa, Asia, and maybe the Caribbean for our bananas and our coffee and our cocoa. And, but they rely on us for many of the staple grains. So maybe we need to, to look at it as a global food system and look at it that crises will happen. And therefore, we should have a different system of how we do regulation and labeling that's flexible to whatever crisis it is. So there's a real argument there for being more resilient, but at a global level. Hans, you have your hand up. I don't know if it, you want to come in. Oh yeah, um, I had a, I noted that already in uh, the chat. Uh, uh, even though let's say the reason to start this seminar is a sad one, but I like the discussion. And what I identify, uh, what I hear throughout is that there is uh, certainly technical feasibilities and even up innovation opportunities. And there will be a challenge for authorities and risk managers to accompany these developments in order to uh, make it a good world, keep it a good world and make it even a better world. So uh, I think uh, that could be one of the, let's say, uh, outcomes of this uh, seminar. I think that's really- I think I do add that, um, I, like, I like people with positive points at the end of a webinar like this one, but it's not just good for the environment, but also that we, that we reflect on the fact that currently the, the consumption behavior uh, in Europe, but not just in Europe, also elsewhere, is, is not good for the people themselves neither, that we need to change behavior because it's, uh, it's putting so much pressure on our social security system as well. And yeah, we've seen how that can collapse with COVID. So yeah, um, it's good for the people, it's good for the planet. Um, and we should see now how we can create opportunities so that it's also good for profit and for innovation. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, I have a question in the chat about the substitution of sunflower oils with other oils and whether there are any relevant contaminants that um, maybe the toxicologists and the food safety people on this call could think should be monitored or any risk of adulteration. Uh, Bert, go ahead. Yeah, um, I can certainly start. Uh, so sunflower oil, when, when you look um, in the past, that has been adulterated with other vegetable oils. Normally, as I said, if it's refined oil from allergenicity point of view, it's not an issue. But there's also been castor oil and paraffins, obviously paraffins not being the healthiest choice. So people have to monitor, I think that needs to be looked at. Um, but I think now, and, and uh, Gianpaolo who asked that question is working in a company that I know is, is very well placed to, to, to look at non-targeted screening. And I want to emphasize that here, we need to be aware that the fraudsters when it comes to fraud, are extremely innovative. And I would say even a tad more than some of the industries are innovative. So they find new substitutes to put in the oil to sell that and to stretch it. So this is where the technologies that, that uh, some of the uh, World Laboratory Network are using non-targeted technologies are very useful to discover those new technologies. I think we need to be on the lookout because now the risk is heightened because we have that extreme shortage of sunflower oils and the prices go through the roof. So this is a time when fraud just kick in. So I think we, we need to be aware of the existing fraud, the existing scams that we have with, with, with palm oil, with paraffin, but also of potential new ones here. 
So thank you for that question. No problem. And Alan, from a technological point of view, a safety point of view? Well, I think um, in terms of substitution with a reputable alternative, we can manage that risk. And I don't think there will be any big food safety issue. I think as Bert has pointed out, the real problem is if prices go very high, the temptation and the, the rewards for fraud and adulteration go up. And that's where, as he's explained, we have to be on our guard and there are processes we can use. But I think substitution is not the problem, it's adulteration for me. It's really interesting. And I think you touched on something about um, substitution there. One of the UK retailers announced last week that they were going to start using palm oil again. So um, in order to keep their prices at a manageable level, that then has implications of, for sustainability and the environmental cost. So I wondered if anyone had any comments about the environmental costs of this kind of crisis. Yeah, but I ahead. think I think on um, anything like that, there are always trade offs. So you can produce palm oil sustainably. You can produce it unsustainably by clear cutting forests. So, you know, that substitution isn't the say. I mean, what we haven't discussed today is biofuel mandates in Europe and North America. I mean, have any countries relaxed biofuel mandates to free up more grain? into the food side as opposed to the fuel side. So I think, you know, for me, sometimes what I see is, is all countries are very, very narrow. They focus on themselves and what makes themselves better off. But actually quite often when they do that, other countries follow suit and everybody ends up worse off. When you, you know, block exports and other people block exports, all it does is drive prices even higher. So I, to me, it's how we, we come together as a global community and figure out how countries do policies that don't actually damage other countries. It's a really good point. Um, I think any, we're, we're pulling to a close. I just wondered if anybody had any final comments or thoughts to share at this stage. Maybe any final questions from the audience? Philip. There are still two questions in the in the Slido. Oh, okay. Let's let's. Uh... Okay. What is the expected impact of food fraud with allergenic products by X peanut oil, which is cheaper? Any? Um, yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm happy to take that one. So, so generally, um, as the food price rises across the board, any product that gets more expensive is likely to have replacement in at some point, not across the industry, of course, there are always some black sheep, but those black sheep will be the ones that, that will be in the headline that uh, may have some uh, compounds in that are also health related, not just an economically motivated deterioration or EMA as it's called. So here, I think this is where, what I emphasized at the beginning, the uh, food vulnerability assessment needs to be revisited by the industry to look at the new situation and where they're sourcing in their, their ingredients from. So if you have a new supplier, you need to basically go through the auditing process. You need to make sure that the supplier has a history of providing safe food and food according to the specification. And you need to still do the spot checks, maybe more frequently now than before. So there are measures, countermeasures that you can put in place to protect your food manufacturer business from being in the headlines for all the wrong reasons. Mm. Louise, maybe we could finish up with a question to the panel about whether they think it would be useful for an organization to produce some sort of guidelines if you like guides about switching commodities and the things to look out for is there any mileage in in that or are other people doing that already i don't know any comments from the panel i mean kate are you aware of um i guess companies are making their own individual decisions but is there any like uh 
bigger i mean there's some interesting things have just come out of the last hour with our discussion you know bigger activities around how to guide the sorts of um um replacements that that could be could be looked at for some commodities uh, um so yeah at the moment certainly companies are um making their own decisions depending on availability and cost um, and you know, does it work in the product as well? Uh, let's not forget. Um, so, so for example, some of the reasons why people are looking beyond rapeseed oil from after sunflower, even before there's a, an issue in terms of supply, is because rapeseed has a bit of a taste and it doesn't work in all products. So, you know, the, there's there's other factors as well beyond availability and mm -hmm. cost. I think. Um, I mean, my, my sense would be it would be incredibly difficult because I think, and Lynn probably knows this, this more than I do, but um, the volatility of commodities is such, and we are entering such a, you know, such a, I mean, we, we already had a volatile period. It's now, is going to be hugely volatile for all the reasons that we've talked about. Um, so I actually think it would be quite, a, it would be a very unpredictable exercise it'd be quite difficult to undertake because it will it will keep changing and the likelihood is it will uh, in terms of supply and demand it will kind of ping pong for a while as people um grow different products to follow what we don't have and then we have an oversupply and then you muddy it in with food versus feed versus biofuels and fertilizer so um i think guidelines in terms of which you'd hope the certainly the relevant competent authorities would do in terms of okay actually is there going to be an issue in terms of um uh, um something in the oil so a, a likely contaminant those sorts of things absolutely the food safety side i think should be definitely looked at in guidelines but to actual commodities i i could imagine that would be quite a difficult exercise to undertake that's fantastic. Uh, Tessa, I'm going to let you have the last word before we wrap up. Uh, yeah, and I think such a discussion should be even broader, not just by substitution of, of um, products, of commodities, but the vulnerabilities in the food system to identify them. Today we talk about oil, but what about soy in the long run? What, what if something happens in, in, uh, in the soy production? Uh, there, we in Europe are even more vulnerable. These effects will be even way, way more than we have now with Russia and Ukraine in terms of wheat, sure, not in terms of energy. But these are things that we need to open up the discussion and, and talk about that with, with all the actors in the chain because they all affect it when we have such a crisis. Thank you. I think that's a really good point, Tessa, that we, um, we come together for this instance, motivated by the Ukraine-Russia crisis and the impact on certain commodities, but there are bigger implications and there is a lot of work to be done to make sure that we have a, a globally resilient supply chain that is fair to everyone. Um, thank you all. I hope we will have a nice report and we will have um, some input from all of you um, to Rachel and Ellen's um, first draft. Uh, thank you everyone else for attending and thank you is Ilse and Isabel in particular for organizing this webinar. Um, we will post our report on the website and we will um, let, keep you informed of any publications that result. Thank you all very much and have a great day. Thank you so much. Bravo.